second talk in this special session. We're going to be hearing from Zeus Dante Simora and Prakad Namame. We'll be well, talking about the second dwarf game, as is the next talk. But this talk is continuing analysis of the second dwarf game. Hello, everyone. Uh, see, I know what you're thinking. What is second dwarf? Slow, let's go slow. Before I correct that, we need to do some background. That's good. Uh, so, for the purpose of this talk, we're going to be labeling the Fibonacci numbers as F1 plus 1, F2 plus 1, and so on. Uh, by doing that, we have a second dwarf theorem, which says that every positive integer can be uniquely written as a sum of distinct non adjacent Fibonacci numbers. For example, this year can be written as F16 plus F13 plus F8 plus F6 plus F1. And to distinct this decompos the decomposition from the actual sum, we're going to write this decomposition changing the plus signs to and signs. Uh, Alright, so if we have uh, given a decomposition of n, uh, it can be second dwarf or not. What makes it not be second dwarf? Yeah, one thing that can make it not second dwarf is if the non adjacent thing is not satisfied. So we can have fk minus 1 and fk. How can we make it more second dwarf? Oh, we can use the Fibonacci relations to change those two consecutive ones to the next number, and that's gonna make it a little bit more second dwarf. We're gonna fix that mistake. And if another mistake that can happen is that if we have the same property, so we have two copies of the same number, that's a problem. But we can use the Fibonacci relations to change that to fk plus one and fk minus two, and that's gonna fix everything up. The, 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 the equation is going to keep being true. There's a couple of uh, odd cases in this thing. I mean, it came out of shoes not all defined, so we need to do them separately. But basically, the idea is that by doing that, uh, you can start by with any decomposition, and intuitively, by doing this process of doing those changes, we make it more second dwarf until we cannot make it more than that. It is the second dwarf. All right, based on that, a uh, previous small group have introduce a two-player game. Uh, we start with the simplest decomposition of a number n that there is, which is right n uh, once, and then two players alternate by playing the games that are described in those two. So there are some kind of combined rules which take two uh, Fibonacci numbers and change to one Fibonacci number, and there are split rules which take two Fibonacci or two copies of the same Fibonacci number and kind of split them apart. Players will alternate by playing those moves, and the last player to move wins, or the player who cannot move loses. Alright, one perspective is going to be useful to understand this game later. It's thinking about a collection of boxes and bins. And so, for example, the initial state uh, is going to be n tokens and the box related to Fibonacci number one, and zero everywhere else. And the moves are going to be changing position of those tokens uh, in a way that the sum remains the same. All right, what do we need to understand this better? First, we need to play the game. So, can anyone give me a number? You, give me a number. Nine. Nine, that's the number I was going to choose. Great. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's start with nine. I am going to be the first player, so I'm going to be Alice, as always. Profile is going to be Bob, as always. Uh, I'm going to start by doing the only move I can, which is flip to F1. So, I'm going to get two F1s and make them uh, F2. Okay. And I'm going to respond similarly. Change two one F1 into an F2, but we now have five and two. All right. Now I have two, three moves I can make. I can uh, combine two of these to make a F2, I can split these two F2s here, or I can get one of these and one of these and put something here. I don't know, I'm gonna do this. So now, I feel like I want to end the game very quickly, so I would combine here, and I would leave this as this is. These are now zeros, and I have a one. Yeah, four. Ending the game is a good idea when you're in the middle of the talk. So, I'm gonna do this quickly. You don't have much choice, and you have some choice, but I have free choice, but well, I just combine here. As you can see, we don't know how to play this game very well. We should. Okay, I won. Yeah, Prakar does not have a move now. Uh, we've reached a second position, and I won, because I was the 
cost way too much. All right, some things we know about this game. First, it is guaranteed to terminate, uh, an example here, but the idea to prove that it's going to terminate is to assign a value to each of those configurations and basically all moves decrease this value and since there are fi finitely many possible values uh, we cannot have a loop and the game, the game has to end. And it terminates at zero optical position because that's the only game state that you cannot claim by, by definition. Another property that we have is that for all and we're going to the second player has many strategy but I like to phrase this theorem a little bit different. I like to say that play one does not have a winning strategy because that's how they proved it. Uh, the proof is non constructive, is by uh, you, you show that player one cannot have a winning strategy, so as of now, we don't know how player two should play to leave. All right, now I'm gonna pass to Brick to talk about game lengths. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the game lengths. So there are some pretty good works that have talked about uh, kind of game lengths and how short it can be or how long it can be. Talk about like doing this move so that it can end faster. So the first result is by Barrett and et al. in 2018 for your minimum game length, which is n minus z of n, where z of n is the number of some integers in the domain composition of n. And you can think of that as uh, n being the number of starting token and z of n being the number of, n of ending tokens. So z of n for of z of 9 would be 2. for the longest game, this is the upper bound, which is sharp for some n, but not for all n, and in general it's not sharp. Uh, here we have an iron notation, iz of n, which is the sum of each of these in the second of decomposition. We use the example 2022 to calculate the z of 2022 and iz of 2022. As you can see that iz is definitely larger than z. The order is that iz of n is around about n squared and z of n is one n. So in general, they don't really factor much in the upper bound. And so the paper by Kizenta also introduced some notation uh, mck and msk. Basically for the number of times the mck and msk are performed. And we also present our result using that notation. Here you can see the main result is that for k between two and little n minus one, little n being the object of sum n, the second object of zero n. So for n being nine, little n would be uh, four. Oh, uh, yeah, so little n would be five, which is eight, the largest uh, second dog, uh, the largest Fibonacci number. And we get that this thing is constant. There's no easy way to get a clue for what this constant value, because by our proof, we basically relabel the board Instead of having f1, f2, f3, f4, f5, we keep the first k uh, value to 6, and then we tweak the other bits after it a little bit by adding the two bits before it, but then subtracting one for that sum. And if you look carefully, all the sk, dk, dk plus 1, and those moves in the uh, term there would change the value sum. And since we know that it starts at n tokens in the f1 position, and the NSA fixes the canopy composition of the N, we know what the sum goes from, and so therefore those moves added up must be constant. And now we present our second result on the use of gain moves. Uh, this is much simpler. It's already relating C1 and F2 to each other. C1 would be uh, F1 and F1 can be F2, and F2 would be uh, F2 and F2 become F1 and F3. These are the exception moves that are different from the natural moves that we have. And the proof is that instead of doing uh, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, we do 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so on and so forth. And again, we see that all the, these exception moves, C1 and F2, would change the weighted sum. And we know that the weighted sum goes from 2n to b of n. This approximately b of n is because instead of getting, say, 1 and 8, you're not getting 2 and 13 instead, so you're shipping every sum n forward by 1, which is approximately by 1 times b. And the approximation error is at most b minus 1. And from that result, we can use this 
and get another upper bound for the game, which is in Montreal, which we went over to the uh, upper bound. The original paper was criticized through the, their upper bound using uh, linear algebra, but this one is by conventional proof, basically. And so now, having the back to the to talk about the composing of the game. All right, so we have seen that prior work has studied how, how short and how long can the game be, and but they also describe what those games kind of look like. So a shortest game uh, is obtained by playing only combined moves. Uh, all of them, actually, all shortest games are only playing combined moves, but you can achieve that by exclusively playing the right most combined moves possible, and that's going to guarantee that you only use combined moves. And the longest game, uh, one way to obtain a, a longest game is to always play the C1 move and the splitting moves when, when you can, and if you cannot, you play the left most combined move. So a theorem that, uh, a question that you may ask is, does every game length between the shortest game length and the largest game length is obtainable? And the answer is yes, we have proved that. Uh, so the way to, that we do that is by induction, so the idea is to play sub-games and then compare them to the games of the, the larger you could. So first of all, first we're gonna look at the families in which we have the initial composition, we separate one token and kind of ignore it, and we play all games we can with the remaining tokens, which are here in blue. Uh, and then after that, we're gonna get the, the token that we kind of let it be, uh, and we're gonna get the second draft composition of N minus one, and after that, there is actually a unique game uh, that terminates this. And by induction, uh, the first set of things has a, a game length, oh sorry, yeah, it's an interval of game lengths, uh, and when, after when you play the unique game, that interval just shifts, so it's still an interval. And a thing to be aware is that the shortest game is contained here, well, a shortest game is contained here. Uh, but basically the key idea is that if you only play combined moves, you have the shortest game, and so only th there is, in the all games, there is one of them which only plays combined moves, and after that the unique game actually only plays combined moves also, so a shortest game is in this family of games. A second family of games that we're going to see is by doing the same thing, but instead of separating n minus 1, we separate f little n minus 1, where little n is the largest in the of position of big n. And then we again we play all games using those, and then we play the longest game. So by induction, playing all games is going to yield an interval, and playing the longest game is only going to shift that interval, so it's going to still be an interval. And the thing to note is that the longest game is of this form. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, you, you can see that we play the long, the, 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 sorry. We play C1 and SK whenever possible. When, when we do that, we have the longest game. And actually, there, there's a way to do that only by playing C1 and SK moves on those blue tokens. And after that, the longest game also does that. Uh, all right, so the idea is that the first top one is going to yield a game line from L1 to R1. The second top is going to yield an intro from L2 to R2. And we just need to check some things. If we check the shortest game is the first one, we check that. Uh, the longest game is the second family, we check that. And then you can do some things to check that uh, L2 is smaller equal than R1, and that's going to mean that those intervals are going to overlap, and overall we're going to have an interval of game lengths from the shortest game length to the longest game length, which is what I wanted to prove. All right, now we're going to pass back to Prakash to talk about random games. Okay, so now we are going to talk about what random games are and how do we define it. And this notion of random game is part of the experimental paper. Um, the definition I did here is one that if you are given a game state, you just choose to move randomly as if you have no strategy at all. Uh, and this is like a probabilistic notion of like a dog game and how we can get game lengths from such a random game. So the conjecture that they found uh, is that as n goes to infinity, our starting number of tokens going to infinity, and the games that are defined as the, this kind of random game would converge to a Gaussian distribution game length. So why did they make this conjecture? Well, they achieved like 9,999 random second dog game on this big n equal to 200, and that's the graph that they get, and it fits pretty well with the Gaussian distribution. 
Unfortunately, we have not been able to prove this conjecture for now, uh, but we do have some results surrounding this random game and damage process. So our result is that as the game goes to infinity, the probability that player one is the, win the winner and player two is the winner approach a half. And the proof of that is that, so given a sequence of moves in the game, say, from the beginning to the end, there are certain things that you can tweak in the sequence to change the length of the sequence. And since we only care about whether it occurs odd or even, that's basically the idea of the proof. Uh, the specific sequence that we are looking to toggle between is between CK and performing SK to BK minus 1. These two moves change the token in exactly the same way. It's just that one does it in just one move and the other does it in two moves. And if you toggle between the two, you can see how the sequence changed length by one and changed the depth pattern between two. So we partitioned a set of all uh, second dog game sequence and the moves that contain in it. Then they are represented by one base sequence that represents like family of all these many games that can be get by just toggling between the two moves. And then we use the law of total probability to get the probability that player one wins. And what we found is that by using the uh, random game definition that we are working with, this toggling is not going to map between games that are equally likely to cohere because one used just one move and is more likely to cohere than the one that used two moves. But most of the game that, most of the base sequence is going to have a lot of like toggle. And basically it becomes a, that length becomes a binomial random variable with exploding variance. So the variance is so high that you basically hit odd values and even values that equal uh, likelihood. And so that gives us the uh, one half probability of player winning. And our future work now would be improving the upper bound of the game because the upper bound is only charged for certain value of S, but not all S. Uh, obviously, we are trying to prove the homogeneity of the game, of the random game. And we are, are still also in the quest of finding the explicit winning strategies for player two. And it would also work if we just found it for certain values of N, just like the upper bound. And that's the end of our talk. Thank you for listening. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the Ohio State University and the IMC for inviting us and our colleagues and friends at the Tomorrow Youth Program. And we would like to take any questions you have. Okay, what questions do people have? Is there a reason as a player for why you would want to extend the length of the game? Well, for a player, they only care about the parity of the game. But being able to extend the length of a game gives you the choice of like basically if you're fun moving uh, parity, you will probably want to extend the game or maybe shorten the game. for proof that uh, player two has a winning strategy uh, kind of exploits this idea that there are some uh, sequence of moves that are, are the same uh, and they change parity so that well, the second player can kind of steal the winning strategy from player one. So for example, if player one has, the, the proof goes somewhere like this. Suppose player one has a winning strategy uh, and then you see which other places uh, player two would also have a winning strategy or player two one would have a winning strategy. Uh, and then you can basically find a uh, contradiction using those kind of uh, triangular moves, which you can either do two moves or one move directly. Uh, 
So I think if I do randomly, you kind of lose that. Uh, and, and and I would guess that it would be pretty quickly this uh, this happens. And, and the winning strategy would not be very advantageous for uh, for a player to if if, you're, if they're playing randomly. 